So we're gonna let's talk about electric fields from the electric potential. Now uh, we just talked about electric potential, uh, which is a useful thing, but physicists quite often find electric potentials because they're relatively easy to find, and then they use those functions, those electric potential functions, to calculate the electric field. So it's pretty cool. Now, we said that a change in voltage, okay, and remember, a voltage is a scalar, is equal to negative E dot dS. Okay, now, let's, um, we're going to do this very generally. We're not going to do it for a point charge or anything like that. Um, let's take a look at these guys. And, and look at them in terms of their components, right, in, in three-dimensional space. We can say that E, it has EX in the i-hat direction plus some component in the j-hat direction plus some component in the z-direction or k-hat direction. But, but the same is true for ds right? ds is just some little infinitesimal displacement in three-dimensional space. So ds will have some little component in the i-hat direction, the j-hat direction, and the, uh, what's the other one? Oh, yeah, z. Okay. Now, I you know, we, we've talked about dot products before. If I expand this out, it gets it gets pretty pretty ugly. Let's just look in, in one dimension right now. Let's just look in the x direction. So if I, in other words, if I do E dot ds, I'm really d taking this and dotting it with this. And remember that, um, well, what you end up, oh, we've got, we got room and we got time. This is really kind of the integral of, Um, EX DX plus EY DY. That's kind of fun to say. But this is easy DZ. Okay, no. Okay, so that's, that's kind of what's going on. So um, what I'm going to do is just look at the, let's say everything's along the X component here. So really we can say, hey, the change in voltage along the X um, is, well, let's just say that it's negative EX dx. So we're just going to look at that part right now. And that's all we're going to do in here is just look in, in one uh, dimension. Uh, and then when you all eventually take the equivalent of, of, of math 6 uh, somewhere, then you'll, you'll, you'll actually do you know, vector calculus and you'll do gradients and stuff. And it's, it, is, it, it is very cool. Well, I'll show it to them. But, all right. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the integral sign away. I'm going to go, no. <laughs> That's my way of saying, go, go away, get out. <laughs> EX DX. Now, think what's going on here. At some location in space, I've got an electric field, a component of the electric field in the X direction, and I multiply that by my displacement in the X direction. But this displacement is infinitesimal. So the change in voltage due to these two components is also infin infinites infinitesimal. Did I say that right? Infinitesimal. Something like that. Okay, so this was dv. Okay? Um, now, I can, and by the way, I'm not doing this mathematically totally correctly, because I'm, um, and I'll show you the mathematically correct way here in a minute. But what I can do now is treat this like, um, like a fraction. I mean, this is a little tiny thing is equal to this electric field times this little tiny thing. 
Well, just divide by this little tiny thing. Divide by dx. And I get dv dx is equal to negative ex. Now, um, so this gives me, now I can solve for the electric field. Now, the electric field is what we want. As a physicist, what you want is to figure out what the electric field is due to some charge distribution. Why? Because we're trying to understand forces. We're trying to understand nature, you know, how nature is going to behave. So if you've got some electric field, you put some charge in there, boom, there it goes. All right. So that's what we're trying to figure out. And that's how we, you know, we make all kinds of electrical devices. Shh. All right. So, so really, EX is equal to negative uh, dV dx. So look, look. Here's what we're saying. If I can come up with a voltage equation, that is a a a, a function of the voltage is a function of x. If I take the derivative of that, I, I get the electric field in the x direction. Now, the way I've written this, I've written it as if it's a whole complete derivative. But you're going to learn, you know, some of you already have, many, uh, almost all of you will in the very near future, will learn about a different way of taking a derivative called a partial derivative. Okay, did, thank you. Um, did you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's way. Hey, hey, it's partial derivatives are way easier than all that stuff. Uh, I mean, a whole derivative. Way easier than your professor thinks. Huh? When he spends like three weeks teaching you how to do that, you're like, this is not hard. Yeah, yeah. It's act. All you. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you. What I'm going to do is give you the, uh, the whole thing here. Um, the whole the correct definition even though you aren't going to need to use it on, on any test I give you okay because this will work because what I'm going to do on the test is I'm going to give you the voltage as a function of X all by itself there's not going to be a Y or Z and then you just take the derivative of it with respect to X put a negative sign in front of it and now you know what the electric field is so but here's the the whole thing the electric field is equal to negative partial V, partial X. Now that's the derivative of the voltage as a, um, with respect to X and uh, in the I hat direction plus partial V, partial Y. So now we're taking the derivative of this with respect to Y plus, oh and I, get, I need to put like brackets around this, partial V, partial Z in the k-hat direction, am I still on camera? Okay. All right. So, now what makes a partial derivative different than a whole derivative? Well, let's say I've got a, uh, a voltage equation. Like, let's say I'm just making something up here. Um, 3xy. Okay, now, if I was to take the derivative of this with respect to x, Think of the, those of you in calculus right now. If I was to take the derivative of this with respect to x, I have to use the product rule, don't I? Because I've got an x and a y, and I'm going to end up with a dy dx. Right? When I take the whole derivative, does that make sense? Yes. But when you take a partial derivative, here's the joy, OK? You say, no, no, I'm going to treat y like it's just a constant. Like it's 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 just three times two or something, okay? You just leave it up. So I'm gonna rewrite it. I'm just gonna say, okay, three y x, and I'm just gonna treat the, the y like it's a constant. So when I take partial v, partial x, all I'm doing is saying, all right, it's oh let's just for fun, let's make this x squared so we just get something, okay? All right, because otherwise it's gonna be too boring. All right, we just say, okay, 3y. We're just going to treat the y like it's a constant. So there's going to be no dy dx. There's no product rule here. You just treat it like it's a constant. And then you take the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. So this is going to be 6yx is my answer. 
Now that's what makes a partial derivative different than a whole derivative. All the other variables, oh sorry, all the other variables, you, you know, if you have, if you're taking the derivative with respect to uh, x, all the other variables you just treat them like a constant. So it's easy. Now what if I took the derivative of this, what is um, uh, partial v partial with respect to y here? Well, this is, you just treat the 3x squared as a constant, and now that take the derivative of y, well, the derivative of y with respect to y is just 1. Whoop, there's 1. Okay, and you're, and you're done. It's easy. It's an easy, uh, partial derivatives are nothing to be afraid of. So, um, now this whole thing right here, this taking a, a derivative with respect to x, y, and z, three-dimensional space, this is very difficult to write down. It takes a lot of room. And physicists by nature are very lazy people. That's what I've noticed. So we have a way of writing all this down with a little symbol. We use this upside down triangle it's times Adele. V. What? It's Adele, but not like a singer. Yeah. Adele? Yeah. It's called Adele. It's Adele. Okay. So it's like a singular yeah. Adele. So now I just call it the gradient. The electric field is equal to the negative gradient of this guy. Now, this happens a lot in physics where it's very convenient to have a a function that is a scalar function when you take the gradient of it you end up with a vector so it's a scalar function you take the gradient of it you get a vector now here's an example of a um, a scalar function that I think you can all imagine that would allow you to uh, you know have a uh, you know, use a gradient, uh, like temperature. Um, let's say you have um, a, a, a scalar field of temperature. So let's say you've got a room and maybe there's a hot stove in it, but all throughout this room you've got thermometers. Okay, so here, let me get on camera here. Here's a room and you put a thermometer here, 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 here. You just have a grid of thermometers. Sorry, not very good grid, but oh well. Get what you pay for, people. All right. Now, if you say, well, these are really hot, so maybe this is uh, 100 degrees, and this maybe this is 90, 90, 90, and this would be 80, 80 over here, 80 over here, 80 over here, uh, 70. Se I'm just making stuff up here. Sorry, folks. 70. 70, 70. Now, do you see that there is a um, there is a gradient of temperature here? Now, temperature is a scalar. But I think you can see that the rate, there's a kind of a rate at which temperature is changing per meter. Let's say these are like all a meter apart or something. And there is a direction to that change. So you could say, well, as I go in this direction, the temperature is decreasing at 10 degrees per meter. And so that 10 degrees per meter is a, is a vector, while the temperatures themselves are a scalar. So um, you know, this, this idea of a gradient, like there are pressure gradients. You hear um, meteorologists talking about pressure gradients you know when you have a one you know weather system moving in you have an area of low pressure and a area of high pressure now pressure air pressure is a scalar but how air pressure changes through three-dimensional space is a vector the, the gradient of pressure is a, so this idea of a this a del thing here this del or, or the, the gradient uh, operator is very common in physics and science. It's worth studying, okay? 
Now, I'm just, I just spent all this time talking about something that I'm not going to test you on. <laughs> all right? So, so basically, what I'm going to do is reduce it to this right here, okay? So I'm going to give you a, a function, a voltage function that's going to be a function of x, and x alone. And then I'm going to ask, what is the electric field? And you just take the derivative and put a negative in front of it, and you got it. Now, by the way, this has, we did the same thing a month or two ago in mechanics, where this was force, and instead of voltage, we had potential energy. So it's this, it, it, and it is the same thing, except this is per unit charge. You know, the electric, if I just put a Q naught out here and a Q naught out here, it would be what we did in mechanics. The force is equal to the negative derivative of uh, potential energy. All right. <coughs> so now I would like to talk about uh, electric fields and uh, lines of what we call equipotential surfaces. And it relates to all of what we just did. Um, so let's take a look at a uniform electric field first. Uh, this is the easiest way of looking at it. So let's say I have a plate here and I have a plate here and I'll hook this up to a battery of some kind. Like our robot battery or something, I don't know. Yay. Yay. Go team 1671. All right. All right, now, um, so let's say that this battery is depositing positive charge over here and negative charge over here. This little arrangement, by the way, is called a capacitor, and we're going to study capacitors. There, there is flux in a capacitor. Now, let's ignore edge effects to make this simple. The electric field would look like this. It'd be a uniform, let's say it's a uniform field between these plates. So there's my E field. And the way I've drawn it, let's just say, okay, it has a magnitude of E and it's in the I hat direction. Okay? Now, I'm going to say that this negative plate has a voltage of zero. V equals zero on the negative plate. Now, I don't have to make it zero. I can make it anything I want. But I'm going to make it zero because it's convenient to put zero right here. Um, this is very similar to um, near the Earth's surface where um, the gravity field is uniform you know, you say, okay, uh, gravitational potential energy, uh, I'm going to make the floor equal to zero. So this is kind of like the floor. And I'm going to take a positive test charge, and I'm going to move it against this field, okay? I'm going to move it uh, here, and here, and here. So let me just do that, that, that. And we're just going to look at how much voltage how much work per unit charge I had to do to get to force this positive charge against that electric field. So let's take a look at the work I did. Now, I'm going to go, you know, E, because the uh, electric field is, is uniform, I can say that um, delta V is going to be equal to negative E dot dr. But when I look at this, what is E? It's E in the I hat direction dot dr, or I, I'm sorry, I should call it ds. Let's call it ds, because r is confusing. Now what is ds, by the way? ds is dx in the I hat direction plus dy in the j hat direction 
plus dz in the k-hat direction, right? I mean, a little three-dimensional displacement has an x, y, and z component to it, right? Well, if I take the dot product, what goes away? i dot j goes away. i dot k goes away. So this is going to, these guys don't even count. Now what's true about e? e is a constant. So it goes out. And so delta v is going to be equal to negative um, e times and then what is the integral of dx? Delta x. So I really want you to learn how to think with calculus. You know, how to take a, a calculus expression and really break it down into what the problem is actually, you know, uh, doing. You know, you can take, you can start off with the most basic principle and then quickly say, oh, E is a constant and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, so what matters here, what this is saying is that the only thing that really matters is my delta x. Well, um, let's put my origin right here. Here's my x-axis. And this is 0. So what's tr if I go from here to here, what's true about my delta x? My delta x is positive or negative? It's negative. So delta x, when I go from here to here, is some negative value. That'll cancel with the negative. So I'm gaining voltage. And doesn't that make sense? That as I move to the left, I'm gaining voltage. Because I'm doing work against this electric field. Well, but take a look at this. What if I, here's some value of x. Here's delta x. From here to here's delta x. Do you see that anywhere along this dotted line I drew, the voltage is going to be the same? I'm going to have the same delta x. If I start here but end up over here, it's the same delta x. Or over here. Or over here. Whatever. Wherever I take my my test charge and put it, it's going to end up with the same voltage, equal voltage. Now this is a cross section, right? This little dashed line really represents a surface that has equal potential. And so we very cleverly come up with a name for that. This little dashed line right here that really represents a plane within this, uh, these two plates of metal with charge with the uniform field between them. It's called an equipotential surface. Now, it's an idea that s students quite often, can be, you know, because this is all so abstract, but you, you have to learn to think like a positive test charge, people. Okay, think positive, charge, Lee, all right? And think, okay, look, I'm over here. I got to do, I got to work against this field to get over here. But it doesn't matter. It, it, no matter where I start, if I, if I start, well, look, this is an equipotential surface, isn't it? The surface of this metal is an equal, what, what is that potential? What is the potential right here? Zero, because we said so. Because we had to pick it to be something. By the way, we will have problems where it won't be. We'll pick this to be not zero. It's, it'll be convenient later on to do that. But it doesn't matter. Now, I'm going to go up here. I mean, maybe this is a 12-volt battery. That's what our, our robot battery is, right? 12 volts. So if I go from here to over here, guess what the potential is on this surface? It's 12 volts. Now, guess what, guess what it is halfway across? Let's say delta x is halfway across. Yeah, it's going to be 6 volts because it's a uniform field. All right, so, so I can now say that, I'm sorry, was there a question? Okay. Right. But right now you're talking about like at one point it's twelve and another point it's six. Oh, well, if 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 I'm a positive test charge and I move from here all the way over 
to this surface, yes. I've had to do 12 joules of work per coulomb of charge. Okay. But if I only go halfway across, I've only done half as much work. Then what were you talking about earlier? That's what. Oh, okay. yeah. it doesn't matter if it's up or down. Yeah, it doesn't matter where you are vertically. All right. Okay? Okay. All right. So this is called an equal potential surface. And it's pretty easy to do. In fact, if you're in a uniform field, you just say delta V is equal to um, E times uh, delta X. Um, and so this is my equation I'm going to use in a uniform field. Now the book goes E times D. And you got to be careful with E times D because I like to keep it like this because you got that negative in there that if delta x has to be in the opposite direction well i'm sorry the, the displacement and the electric field have to be in opposite directions for you to be doing positive work as you move through the field which i think makes sense okay but um so if you just go e times d you kind of lose that um so i like to leave it as just negative e times delta x but you can you can read the book and do it the way you want oh by the way let's take a look at this at what we just did I'm going to say, okay, delta V is equal to negative E times, uh, let's say this is zero, so this is really just X. Instead of delta X, if I start from zero, the delta X just becomes X. Oh, what did we say about E? E is equal to negative dV dx, the X component. Well, look, this is a potential energy function, isn't it? It's the potential energy as a function of x times this pesky little thing here. And so um, I'm just going to take this. Uh, oh, and this should be in the i hat direction. You have to add that i hat direction thing. And so um, I just put negative d dx of e times x. And so now I've got the electric field is equal to, well, take the derivative of this, you just get E in the i-hat direction. But that's what I said before. Okay. So I'm just saying that that little thing that we did before actually works. Now, if you have, now this is all for a uniform charge, but it works for any charge distribution. Okay, um, let's take a look at a point charge. If, um, here's a point charge. And the electric field spreads out in three-dimensional space like this. Right? Now, let's start from infinitely far away and go to this location in space. Well, if, I think you can see that if I'm right here, here's my distance r away, but it only depends on where r is. But r can be anywhere, right? I can make r any. So in other words, this, why did I make it so far away? Because now it's hard to draw. This, and remember, this is all in three dimensions. This makes a three dimension a, a, a surface around this charge that has equal potential because it it takes just as much work to take a positive test charge and move it against the field to get and get it to here as it does to get it here or here or here or here or anywhere on this surface so that's an equal potential surface mm -hmm. now Remember that we said, and what is the voltage? What is the voltage at the surface? Well, we said that the voltage at that surface is equal to uh, KQ over R, right? We just derived that a little while ago. Well, what's the electric field at this point? Well, we already know it, but we can show it. I'm going to watch this. This is pretty cool. The electric field as a function of R here mm -hmm. is going to be equal to negative dV dr. Well, 
in the r hat direction. The r hat, r hat. All right. X, here we had, oops, uh, an X, so that'd be i hat. R is r hat. Well, I'll just take the derivative of this function. Let's see what we get. d dr of k q over r. Well, the k and the q aren't changing with r, so we can pull those out. It's equal to k, uh, negative, oops, let the negative out, k q. And then what is 1 over r? 1 over r is uh, r to the negative 1. So it's d dr of r to the negative 1. Okay. Now, what's the derivative of r to the negative 1? I'll bring this down. So, this is going to be e. I'm going to let the r hat out again. I keep leaving stuff out. So, e as a function of r is equal to negative kq. And this is uh, 1 over r to the negative. Well, this becomes r to the negative 2, right? We use the, the power rule for derivatives, but you have to also multiply by negative one. You bring that, that old exponent down, so that's negative one. The negative cancels the negative, and I just rederived uh, what I already knew from Coulomb's law, k, q over r squared in the r hat direction. Okay, now as I approach this, the voltage becomes greater and greater and greater as I get closer to it. So the equal potential lines, if you want to make them the same amount of voltage apart, they'll get closer and closer and closer together. Okay, now we're out of time, but I want to show you one more thing before you put your stuff away. Stop. This is illustrated very nicely in your book. Okay, here's, here's the electric field. Just a minute. Here's the electric field uh, shown in orange. And in these little blue dashed lines are the equal potential surfaces. And here it is for a point charge. Then they even have a dipole. Positive and negative. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that I... I just want, the last thing I want to show you is that notice that the equipotential surfaces are always perpendicular to the electric field lines. Now they have to be because if you move along the, ele the equipotential surface, you're not changing voltage, which means there can't be any electric field along the direction you're moving. Uh, and the only way that can happen is, is, is if the electric field is perpendicular to the equipotential surface. But this is, uh, now, really, you need to really read and study and think about this stuff. You know, this, this lecture isn't going to be enough. But that's all. Bye.